I think I covered the basics of uh, nozzle a little bit last time. So let's do a quick review. You have some oxidizer and some fuel. If you're NASA, that you really want to push something heavy off and out into space, you know, off the launch pad and out into space, what would be a good oxidizer? O2. And what would be a good fuel? H2. And when they combine, what do you get? Water, H2O. But with a big kick. All right? So now inside here, when you're mixing them and they're combusting, it develops a very high pressure, high temperature, but the pressure is really high. And you have very low flow because it's just coming in. It's not like it's... But coming out, you have a converging section to a nozzle. It becomes faster and faster, and if this high pressure is high enough, it's not that hard to have sonic in the throat. It'll be choked. Then, to make it go faster, you need a diverging section. It's not make it narrower and it'll come out faster. That's the first impression everybody would say. You want a good nozzle? Make a smaller, smaller uh, outlet area. But once you go sonic, once you want to go supersonic, it's not that easy. Okay? So what you have to do is you have to go with a diverging section such that you can get Mach, the, the, the Mach greater than 1. So basic question, if you have a thrust generated by a rocket engine with an exhaust speed of 500 meters per second, a mass flow rate of 200 or 20 kilograms per second, what is the thrust generated by that? Yeah, the forward thrust will be the mass flow rate times the exit speed because it really has no inlet speed. And you can knock out kilojoules, wrong units, kilowatts, wrong units, watts, wrong unit, and it'll be 10 kilonewton. Some students will they'll make the calculation and guess at the units. If they're not used to thrust, what is thrust? Okay, more thrust is generated by increasing the exit speed. That is true. That is absolutely true. The derivation of this very important equation is shown here. But in the interest of time, I'm going to give you the derivation on one slide from NASA. So they're talking about combustion chamber, converging section, the throat, the diverging section of a converging, diverging nozzle. So you have a mass balance for a control volume around there with one inlet, one outlet. You have a conservation of momentum. Hey, we haven't seen a conservation of momentum much in this class before, have we? But it's needed now. Then we have isotropic flow. Does this look familiar? How pressure density vary for isotropic flow? What do you think that gamma is? K. K is a ratio of specific heats. Right up here they tell you. Ratio of specific heats. Some textbooks use K, some gamma. What is this one? Well, you combine the isotropic flow with the conservation of momentum. You get a new equation. Then you combine this equation with the mass balance, and it's just algebra, and you get this very funny equation. In this equation, let's see if we understand each term. What is this cap M right there in this equation? Mach number. What is V in this equation right there? Velocity. What is dv? How it changes. You can have a positive change or a negative change in the velocity. What is a? Cross-sectional area for the nozzle. What is da? It's increasing or decreasing. So if I'm moving in this section called the converging section, da is less than zero. It's negative. It's going, you know, it's decreasing. The area is decreasing, right? If I'm in this diverging section, dA is positive. The area is going up. See that? Now, this little term is really funny. 1 minus m squared. Think about 1 minus m squared. 1 minus m squared. If m, if it's subsonic, m is less than 1, what is that term? If m is greater than 1, what is this term? 
it switches sign and that leads to the very interesting physics. Somebody says, I don't have a good physical intuitive understanding of gas flow through a converging diverging nozzle. Welcome to the crowd of the majority of the world. All I can do is say, this is what happens, and you can explain it by conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, momentum and isentropic flow. And I can understand the manipulation, but the hard part is really understanding why. Why? How can you get a gas to all of a sudden go faster than the speed of sound in the gas? That's an interesting question to me. So you take that equation for the nozzles, and you manipulate it and you express it, I think this way, because it's like, how does the change in the area affect the change in the speed? All I did was manipulate the equation. And you see this term, which is going to change sign. When it's subsonic, that's everything over here, m is less than 1, the world makes sense. I understand a nozzle that is converging nozzle. It's going smaller area. The, the, the dA is less than zero. It's converging. And guess what happens because of this minus sign right here, m squared minus one, is that the speed goes, dV, sorry, goes up. The speed goes up. You know, you could take Bernoulli's equation and go through here. It'll explain it the same thing, Bernoulli's equation. All right. You go to a diffuser, just the opposite, you get more area, slows down. But guess what happens? The world gets turned upside down. When m is greater than 1, this term becomes a negative. It just switches. Oh, you want to slow it down? Don't give it as much area. What? If you want to slow it down isentropically, give it a smaller section. You know, that's a... That's a diffuser, if that makes sense to you, diffuser slowing it down, but the area is getting smaller. Do you see that? This area is getting smaller. Likewise, if you want to speed it up, give it more area. Just backwards. But a, but a general jet engine without having a proper fan, that's the one where on the back they'll go like this and then like that you'll see that little blend in the, in, their, in the tail of that engine. And they'll be able to change it. Is that the example of converging, diverging? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, converging, then diverging, so you can get supersonic flow out. There's two other equations, the stagnation pressure and the stagnation temperature. Especially with rocket design, you have this region in here where it's basically stagnant. And then you have the flow speeding up, then you have Mach 1, and if it could be even higher, right, going out. But the, so the idea of t taking a flow that's in the section and, and relating it back to the stagnation temperature, it's pretty easy to do. What you do is you say, I have the concept that at, if it's stagnant, there's no enthalpy. Now, the enthalpy is non-zero, but there's no kinetic energy. So you have the stagnation enthalpy equal to the current enthalpy plus one-half V squared, the kinetic energy. Replace the delta H by C sub P delta T, so that you get T naught is equal to T plus one-half V squared over C. You have this Mach number related to the speed, and then you have C is square root of KRT, hence V squared is equal to KRTM squared, so you can replace there. And then a property relation. We use a lot that uh, R is equal to C sub P minus C sub V, and this is one of the variations of that equation. Hence, you get this equation. You also have an equation for the stagnation pressure. If you get that first one, this other one is very simple algebra to get the, isent the stagnation pressure. I'm going to solve a problem. Air is an ideal gas with K of 1.4. Enter is a converging, diverging nozzle operating in steady state and expands isentropically. Determine the stagnation pressure. Find P naught. Well, you look at this problem a lot, you almost have to think of conceptually extending back from one 
back to state zero where you have P-naught, the stagnation pressure. And then you look at the equation for how do I calculate that stagnation pressure? I could copy that equation from the previous slide that you have the stagnation pressure is equal to some pressure somewhere in the system times 1 minus K minus 1 over 2 times the Mach number at that location in the system to all to the power K over K minus 1. Here we're given a lot of information at state 1, so put P1 there, the Mach number 1 there. And if you do that, you can calculate that the stagnation pressure is going to be higher than 141 kilopascal. It's going to be around 150 kilopascal. Stagnation temperature, T naught. Well, same concept. You look at the equation, you find that T naught is equal to T at some location. 1 plus K minus 1 over 2, the Mach number squared. Did I drop some sign on that? Let me look back here. This one. Whoops, not far enough. Yep, just that. Thank you. And so now if you say let's evaluate at T1 and Mach 1, you get the stagnation temperature comes in at uh, 0.3 Kelvin. What is the throat area? This small area right there. <coughs> Well, what symbol do they use for the throat area? Something like A asterisk? How do I calculate that throat area? They give you the mass flow rate. M, or, I mean, A, B, rho, or where B is the... Um, v at the throat the divided by... Well, you can put multiply by rho if you like. The density at the throat. Exactly right. The mass flow rate through the throat is given to be 10 kilograms per second, and it always behaves as an ideal gas. You can just use AV rho. So this uh, area of the throat is equal to the mass flow rate divided by the velocity of the throat is the speed of sound in the throat. And the density, I use the density, which is uh, the pressure in the throat, R t in the throat. So I need to calculate the temperature in the throat. How do I calculate the temperature in the throat? Same way. You just go back to this equation and you say I want to know the temperature in the throat is equal to the stagnation temperature t naught divided by 1 plus k minus 1 over 2 m squared and in the throat, what is that M? One, exactly. And we just calculated T naught from before. So you calculate the temperature in the throat, and that comes out to be 250.26 Kelvin. How about the pressure in the throat? That's nice to get the stagnation pressure. It's the same equation, isn't it? So just using this equation, you get the pressure of the throat comes out to 79.29 kilopascal. So it went down, didn't it? it? Was 141 went down about 80 kilopascal. So we have this one. We can get the the speed of sound in the throat, square root of KRT in the throat. We got that. The R is known. Mass flow rate's known. You calculate the area. And that area is not large, 0 0.02857 meters squared. Last one, what is that exit area if it comes out at Mach number 1.6? How are we going to calculate that? Similar idea that you know the mass flow rate is still the same. And you have the area at the exit, the velocity at the exit, and then the density at the exit, which is R. Did I put the density correct? Here's my equation. P is equal to rho RT. Did I write that right? Rho is equal to P over RT. Man, I messed that up. 
didn't I? Whew. P over RT. But the number's correct. I just wrote it wrong. All right. So this is going to be the density, which is P2 divided by RT2. So how do I get T2? How do I get P2? The same equation for the stagnation pressure. You get it to use it to get the pressure at 2. Stagnation temperature, you get the temperature at 2. The velocity at 2, you need the Mach number at 2 times the speed of sound at 2. So you get that way. And you then calculate the area at 2. And so I didn't really, well, I'll just fit it in right there. The area to 0 0.0357 meters squared. Did you solve a problem like this in homework? Yeah. yeah. Somebody says, uh, I'd like to use the table 9-2 that's on the page of our textbook to solve this problem. It's a lot easier, isn't it? If you know what's on here. So here is a function of Mach number. Instead of having the equation, they gave you the number for T over T naught and P over P naught. And then this is A over A asterisk, which is the throat area. So we started off with a 0.3 Mach. And then we knew the temperature at 1. And you wanted to calculate T naught. So T1 divided by T naught from this equation or this table is 0.3. 98232. Actually, it's just the number of the equation that we just calculated for air with K of 1.4. And then the same there. You, and then we said, what's happening at the throat? Well, at the throat, it's Mach of 1. And then you could read off this value, knowing what you calculated for T0, and then calculate T1. Likewise, read off to get P1. So then we came out to 1.6, Mach of 1.6, and use that. This just avoids using the equation. There's one number on this table. If you can just leave this class knowing this from this table, it would be a great, I think I would have accomplished something. And it's this number right here. And it has a lot of applications. Let's say I have a line of compressed air and then I have a little hole in it. And that line of compressed air with the little hole, how many people know roughly the pressure of uh, compressed air lines in shops and stuff? 120-ish PSI gauge, you add another 15, 135-ish. Okay, so let's say it's 135 PSI A. What is the pressure in the air in this room? Around 15 PSI A. That's a big pressure change. If you have a little hole, guess what? It's really loud. And what are you hearing when you hear a real loud noise coming out? You're hearing shock waves because it's choked. Choked flow. Really? I can get choked flow that easy? Yeah, just go poke a hole. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> but if you have a valve and you have a very small little nozzle, in a little ball valve or something, you just open it off a compressed air line, definitely it's choke flow right there. Nice smooth valve going right with a little nozzle. And that's loud as well. Now, if you have a huge nozzle, it'll make it'll bleed the pressure in the line, and don't do that. The shop pressure will go down too much. But this is a huge pressure difference. But somebody says, I wonder if I'll get it uh, if I chop this in half. Let's say I only have 70 PSI A. Will I still get choke flow in a little hole or a valve, small valve with a little nozzle? Somebody says, well, let's keep going. Will I get it if I get it 50 PSIA? What's the minimum pressure across which little nozzle operating gets choke flow? And this is the number right there. Because essentially in here, it's stagnant, essentially stagnant. You can almost ask anybody that studied compressible flow, their aero engineer, they'll, they'll, they'll know this number, 0.5282.
So all I got to do is double. As soon as I go about 30 PSIA, so anyway, a number of a half, if you want to get more precise, 0.52828. And uh, hopefully that's your favorite number for today. Thank you very much.